Hi, I'm Tzachi Levent Levy, founder of Blogic.me and WebRTC Courses. I'm here to break down real-time communications so you don't have to. Time for a short explanation of WebRTC for total beginners. Now, if you ask me what WebRTC is exactly, this is a definition that I almost always use. WebRTC offers real-time communications natively from a web browser. First thing you need to know is that WebRTC is available on all browsers out there. If you want to use voice or video communications in real time, you can do that from any browser today because we have WebRTC implemented there. It doesn't mean that WebRTC must run inside the browser, just that this is available for you. You can also use WebRTC to run it in an application, on a mobile device, on the desktop, a laptop, or even on you know, embedded devices. The second thing is that WebRTC is a media engine with JavaScript APIs. Why is that important? WebRTC is a media engine. We've had media engines before WebRTC for other voice over IP protocols. We'll in a second see what that means. But now we have a media engine that has JavaScript APIs for it. The APIs are implemented and available in web browsers. So any developer can actually go and use these same APIs to build their own applications. So WebRTC creates an ecosystem around it by having a single set of APIs of how it is used and implemented, and by making it available in all, all browsers. What I've said so far is voice over IP, web browsers. That brings us to another point. If we look at WebRTC, it sits right between traditional voice over IP and our internet, the web. Now, voice over IP and the web are two different things. They are two different animals. I come from the voice over IP domain, let's call it. This is where you learn things about standards and how you may make calls and what's ringing and transfer and blind transfer and other words that relate to the world of telephony. In the web, we look at things in different ways with JavaScript and scaling horizontally, not vertically, and doing things in ways that are very different than voice over IP. Since WebRTC is right in the middle, we need to understand some of the things of VoIP and some of the things of the web in order to make sure that we are building things in a way that makes sense to both of these worlds at the same time. Let's go and see how calls are actually made with WebRTC. So we have a user. Let's call him A. That user runs on a web browser on his laptop like I am now. He wants to call or to communicate with someone else with B. B is actually running on a smartphone, on a device. She might be doing it in a browser or an application. We don't really care for this example. Now, how does A and B know that they exist or that how can they even find each other? The answer to that is through something that is called a signaling server. Both users are connected to a signaling server. They are both they both made the decision that they want to communicate with each other and that they are going to do it based on a specific network. It might be WhatsApp or Messenger or FaceTime or a Google Meet call or a third party of some kind or whatever other service. There is a decision that was made that is capable of the discovery part of making sure that when A wants to connect to B, he can actually do that. So what happens now when A actually wants to connect to B? He sends a message, an offer, to the signaling server. That offer message is not part of WebRTC. It is done out of the scope of WebRTC, which again complicates things a bit, but brings a lot of flexibility. That offer message that is being sent has a piece of data in it called SDP, Session Description Protocol, which is part of WebRTC. Inside the SDP, A says things like, well, you know, B, I want to do a video call with you. These are the ways that I can do audio. These are the ways that I can do video. These are the resolutions that I'm supporting. These are the codecs that I use. Codecs are used for compressing audio and video. The different codecs would bring different compression ratios and different qualities to the actual results. Okay, So we've got an offer that is being sent with the SDP. The signaling server received this offer. 
he says, well, this is a message that A wants to communicate with B. So the signaling server is going to send that offer to B. Now, B is going to look at that offer. In this point in time, the phone might be ringing because that's what the application decided to do with that incoming offer. Once B decides to accept this call or this meeting, he is going to send back or she is going to send back an answer. The answer is again an SDP message with an answer component to it that says, well, you know what? These are the things that I support and these are the things that I selected from what you are supporting. Let's start a call. And again, that message itself, besides the SDP part, is out of scope of WebRTC. How it is being sent, you decide in your application. The signaling server receives the answer, checks whatever he wants about that, and then he sends that to A. At this point, both A and B have two SDP components or two SDP blobs of the offer and the answer. They now use these SDP blobs in order to make magic happen. And that magic is sending media directly from A to B and from B to A, having an actual voice or video call between these two participants. And this is done peer to peer. The actual media is sent directly from one user to another, not going through the signaling server at all or through any other server for that matter. This is why in many cases, People refer to WebRTC as a peer-to-peer -peer technology because it doesn't require servers, but it does. We've already seen one server that WebRTC requires, which is the signaling server. Now, WebRTC for me is like a kind of an iceberg. There are things at the top that we see, like this nice drawing and the fact that messages goes back and forth in a way of a call, yay. And then there's a lot that happens below the water level. These are the things that we usually miss with WebRTC. We're going to go deep a bit to see these things now because WebRTC is peer-to-peer, -peer, but it requires a signaling server. WebRTC is peer-to-peer, -peer, but there are other servers with it we might need and the media might not go peer-to-peer. -peer. It might actually go through a server. It brings me to the point of what servers do we actually have in WebRTC? We've seen the signaling server. In many cases, in actual real applications, we are going to also have an application server. We're going to decouple the signaling from the actual application logic. We'll have the application logic connects, connected to the database, for example, and to things that we want to do, authentication and other mechanisms and things that we need in our application, like the web page itself. And the signaling server is going to take care of the real-time stuff of keeping the connections open between the users in the network, having the ability to understand at what state they are. Are they now in a call, waiting for a call, can be called, busy, whatever it is that we want to convey. This is part of the things that the signaling server is going to be in charge of. We might co-locate the signaling with the application server, and we might not, it's up to us. Now, we said that WebRTC is peer-to-peer, -peer, and media flows directly between A and B. But sometimes firewalls and NATs, network address translators, which are kind of switches on the network, are not going to allow us to send media directly from A to B. In such a case, we have STAN and turn servers, ICE protocols, that enables us to make that communication happen. The STAN server, for example, will allow A and B to understand and find their public IP addresses and use that to announce where they can be found, so that once we are trying to do the ICE negotiation to connect this call in the media between A and B, we can check using that public IP address instead of the private one that we would have used otherwise. With TURN, we're going to do something else. We're going to relay the media through a TURN server instead of going direct. We do that when there is no other way of connecting A to B directly. So, WebRTC is peer-to-peer, -peer, but well, media might not actually flow directly even if you wanted to, because there are firewalls and NATs, and now we need to relay that through turn servers. Okay, so it's not always peer-to-peer. -peer. The other thing is that you might not want to have it run peer-to-peer -peer directly, because you might want to introduce media servers into the mix. With media servers, I can do things like 
group calling, have a call between 10 participants, something that they cannot really do peer to peer. We don't have enough bandwidth and CPU power in devices for that. Then we put media servers in other times. I want to do things like record the meeting and store it in the cloud. I would do that with a media server. I might want to connect through a bot, an LLM, generative AI, you know, do these kinds of things. Then again, I need a media server to connect to a cloud-based AI. I might want to, con want to connect to a telephony service, having an agent sit in his home with a laptop using WebRTC and have people call him on the phone. In order for them to call on the phone, they're not going to use WebRTC, they're going to use telephony. And then we have a media server called the gateway that is going to connect from telephony into WebRTC. So there are many reasons why WebRTC is not really peer-to-peer -peer in a lot of different use cases. And to be frank, most services that are production ready, running at scale, that are successful, require media servers for some of the things that they do, if not all of the things that they do. Bear that in mind. So you've seen a bit how things work here. We've seen that there is an offer answer message. We've seen that the media runs directly or indirectly. We've seen that there are different types of servers in the network when we use WebRTC. We haven't discussed the ICE negotiation process, how we connect the state machines in WebRTC. There's a lot more to learn in WebRTC. I want to touch a few more points before we finish today. First one, this is WebRTC's protocol stack taken from the great book, High Performance Browser Networking. This is a rather old book, but is still good today. You can see a lot of different protocols that exist in WebRTC. WebRTC is a standard that has multiple protocols wrapped into it. These protocols are not specific to WebRTC. WebRTC uses them in a very specific way. Now, the right-hand side of this diagram holds WebRTC implementation itself. We've got their I stand and turn. We've seen these already. Here there are the client side implementations of these servers. And ICE is the algorithm that does this negotiation and make sure that we actually can connect the call no matter the network. Then we've got the layer for DLS, which adds security on top of UDP. And with SRTP, secure RTP, real-time protocol, which is used to actually send the audio and video in real time. This is a known voice over IP protocol that is used almost across all voice over IP protocols and implementations. And then there is SCTP, which is used for the data channel. The data channel enables us to send whatever you want directly between the two peers, not specifically audio and video. So we can send things like keyboard presses, mouse moves, telemetry, images, or other data that we want to send. And yes, we can also send audio and video over SCTP and the data channel if we really want to. The left-hand side is interesting. The author of the book decided to show that as part of WebRTC, although it isn't. Why it's not? Because this is what you have in the browser to enable signaling for WebRTC. So if I want to send that offer and answer messages or any other additional messages like on ICE candidates and you know, disconnect calls and things like that, I need a signaling channel. And since we said that that's out of scope of WebRTC, the way we're usually doing, going to do that are by ways that are available in the browser. And these ways for signaling are XHR, SSC, and WebSockets. XHR and SSC runs on top of HTTP. In the case of WebRTC, that's going to be HTTPS, which is why I have TLS in there. And that's going to happen on top of TCP or on top of UDP with HTTP 3 today. So we've got all of the media stack running on top of UDP most of the time, and this is what we want. That's where real time thrives and works really, really well. And the signaling usually runs on TCP because we need reliability for these messages. When it comes to security, WebRTC is secure by design. It doesn't mean that you don't need to deal with security or think about that, but it means that WebRTC in a way forces you to deal with security and to work with security. How it does that? Simple. The actual SRTP protocol is secure RTP. It comes in a way that you cannot send media if it's not encrypted on the network. That's one. SCTP runs on top of DTLS, which means that it's secure as well. On the other side of the stack, where you don't have WebRTC, there's TLS. 
It says here that it is optional, but not exactly. It is optional, but if you actually use it in that way and say, well, I don't want TLS, the browsers are going to make your life really, really hard in the user experience. So we're going to end up running secure sockets or secure web sockets or HTTPS, the secure HTTP variant of HTTP. And then TLS is kind of mandatory here. So RTC is secure by design. And then your application, you need to take care of the security of the application, but at least the media engine that you use comes with security in mind. The last thing I want to touch today is the fact that you need to understand that you are not in control when it comes to WebRTC. There are four different actors in WebRTC. The first one is your application. You're building the application, you're making the decision there, it's yours, you control the application totally and fully. Then there are the browsers. The browsers, you don't control them. These come from Google, from, from Apple, from Microsoft, from Mozilla and from other companies. All of these browsers are out of your control. Google can update Chrome without asking you, and it happens all the time, on a monthly basis, okay? Things change, the behavior of WebRTC implementations change, and you need to keep track of that and be up to speed with these things. This is going to affect how you're going to do the QA, how you're going to deliver bug fixes, and how you're going to do all of the upgrades of your system. Then there's the networks. Users connect from whatever network is their own, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, cellular, inside basements, elevators, their homes, hotels, hospitals, whatnot. You don't know what networks your users are using. In many use cases, you don't control or own the networks. In some, very few, you do. WebRTC has mechanisms to deal with different types of networks. Your application need to be aware of that as well. Last but not least, are the user's devices and peripherals. What device are they using? Is it new or old? Is it a laptop or a smartphone or a tablet or an embedded device? What kind of camera and microphone do they have? What are the speakers or screen resolution? The CPU, these things are going to affect the user experience. You need to be aware of that. And again, in most cases, in most scenarios, you are not going to control these devices. You just need to be able to work with a variety of things that are going to come your way. We've seen WebRTC. We now understand how it works a bit and a bit about the ecosystem around it and the main concepts of that. If you want to learn more, you can follow me at bloggeek.me. You can also check my courses at webrtccourse.com. There are free courses there around WebRTC basics and the WebRTC code lab that will take you hand in hand to build your first WebRTC application with an explanation of how to use the APIs. So see you there.